Good evening. It's great to see all of you in God's house this evening. This weekend, we are observing proper eight in the Christian church year. And the theme that our lessons center on for this evening is the Christian loves God more than above all things. And now, that's not to say we aren't supposed to love the blessings God gives us. But our love for those things must not be greater than our love for God. May God bless our worship of his holy name. We begin with our opening hymn, Praise to God, Immortal Praise. Please stand. We worship our Lord and Savior according to the, the divine service too, which is printed on the PowerPoint. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, faithless worrying and selfish pride, or sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great love for us, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. 
I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us to love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. In our Old Testament reading for tonight, we see that it did not take long for Israel to break their covenant with the Lord. Soon after that, with Aaron's help, they fashioned and worshipped the golden calf. Moses, in love for God, reacts in anger to this horrible violation but the Levites rallied to Moses' call and showed that they loved them more, even more so than they loved their brothers. And we see tonight that total commitment to God did not bring peace, but a sword. A reading from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 15 through 9. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, written on one side and on the other. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, 
There is the noise of war in the camp. Moses said, It is not the sound of people who shout for victory. Neither is it the sound of people who cry because of defeat. But I do hear the sound of people who are celebrating. As soon as Moses came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned. So he threw the tablets out of his hands, took them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, and scattered it on the water. Then he made the people of Israel drink it. Moses said to Aaron, Why did these people, what did these people do to you that you have brought such a great sin on them? Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know these people. They are set on evil, so they said to me, Make, us, make a God for us. Go ahead of us. Because this Moses, the man brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, whoever has any gold, pulled it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire. And how came this calf? When Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get so out of control that they were disgraced among their enemies, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. All the descendants of Levi gathered themselves together to Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Every man is to strap his sword on his thigh and go back and forth throughout the camp, from one gate of the camp to the other. And every man is to kill his brother, and every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. The Levites did what Moses said. And that day about 3,000 men... Moses said, begin your service of the Lord today. Yes, because every man among you took a stand against his son and against his brother. The Lord is bestowing a blessing on you today. The word of the Lord. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 27. We sing it as written on the PowerPoint.
In our epistle reading for tonight, the Apostle Paul encourages the believer to flee the love of money and the good fight faith. Doing this shows love and total commitment to the only immortal and invisible God. A reading from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. But you, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. You were called, and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who made a good confession as a witness before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this command without spots and without fault, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will make known at the proper time, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, who lives in a, in a whom no one has seen or is able to see. To him be honor and power forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Alleluia. Alleluia, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. In reverence for the gospel, please. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 34 through 42. This, this lesson will also be the basis for this evening's sermon. Our Savior says to us, Do not come that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous man, will receive a righteous reward. To drink, because he is my disciple, lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be singing it. We sing our hymn of the day, Come Follow Me, Our Savior Spoke.
How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that indeed is what we are. Amen. In the name of our Savior, dear friends, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. If you were one of the 12 disciples standing there listening to Jesus say this, how would you react? Maybe you'd think, wait, what? Lord, what did you just say? Did you just say you did not come to bring peace? But you're the Messiah. You're the one Isaiah, Moses, and all the prophets of old said would come and save his people. You are the son of David, the one long foretold to sit eternally on the throne of his father David. You're the one whom angels sang about at your birth, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward mankind. You're the one who's been prophesied to restore the house of Israel. And as if these aren't enough, you're also true God come down in human flesh. You're the all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere Lord of heaven and earth. You create all things by your word. You govern all things with your mighty hand. You alone can settle all the unrest in this world and bring lasting peace. But now you say you've come not to bring peace, but a sword. Lord, that doesn't sound like you. Didn't you just a little while ago in your Sermon on the Mount say, we ought to love our enemies and pray for them? Are you now walking that statement back? Lord, what are you saying? Maybe the disciples thought these thoughts. So we don't know what they were thinking as they listened to Jesus say this. But it maybe wouldn't be surprising if they had thoughts like these. After all, they did also have a different view of the Messiah before Jesus came to earth. You see, when the twelve were growing up, they had been told that the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, as Isaiah calls him, would bring earthly peace. And considering the times they lived in, that would seem like a logical conclusion. Because don't forget, at this time, it's the Roman Empire who's the big bad dog in the world. They have conquered every known corner of the world, and that includes Judea and Galilee. So no doubt this may have led the Jewish religious teachers to say that the Messiah would be an earthly conqueror. He would be someone who would drive the hated Romans out of the land, reestablish the long-lost kingdom of Israel, and then bring peace to everywhere over the earth. Thus, it wouldn't be surprising if the 12th thought this about Jesus, if they had thought he came to bring earthly peace. But Jesus shoots down that image. Do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So wait, is Isaiah wrong in declaring Jesus the Prince of Peace? Or are the angels wrong for seeing on earth peace, goodwill toward mankind? Are all the prophecies about the Messiah bringing peace just empty promises? Oh, not at all. Jesus has indeed come to bring peace. But he doesn't come to bring earthly peace. He comes to bring peace between sinful mankind and the holy and righteous God of heaven and earth. And this peace would be proclaimed through Jesus' word, which condemns sinners for, for their sins, but then assures them that Jesus has taken away their sins. But not everyone is going to welcome this peace. That's why Jesus says he's come to bring a sword. Well, make no mistake about it, his word will be proclaimed. In fact, these words of Jesus are his last instructions to the twelve before they set off on a mini-mission journey. But as the twelve proclaimed Jesus' peace, some people would reject it. 
just as people reject our proclamation of Jesus' peace today. Some people will reject Jesus' peace because they don't want to give up those sinful habits they've been living in for years. Some people will reject Jesus' peace because they don't like being called sinful because God knows they've done their best to live a decent life and have done their super best to not do anything bad or serious. But to hear that they are still sinners just doesn't sit well with them. Some people will reject Jesus' peace because they think they can manufacture peace with God on their own terms. Thus, these unbelievers will look down on all those who do listen to Jesus' word and believe it. And this is going to result in strife and hardship between people. Just how deep is this strife and hardship going to run? Jesus, quoting the prophet Micah, says, this strife is going to run deep. It's going to run even into one's own family. A son is going to be against his father. And a daughter will be against her mother. The family is going to be split because there will be some who will listen to the word, believe it, and cling to it with all their strength. But there will also be some who will refuse to listen and thus look down on those who do listen. But for those of you who do listen, be careful that you don't value your love for your family members more than, you, than your love for me. For whoever loves father, mother, Son, daughter, or anything else more than me is not worthy of me. Hold on there, Lord. Are you saying we shouldn't love our family members? Are you saying if they don't believe the word as we believe it, we should shun them? Now, Jesus does call us to love our family members. I mean, that's why he gives us families in the first place. He gives people in our lives who love us and support us. But love of Jesus must always be number one in a person's life. So if that means that you have to cut those close bonds between uh, you and a loved one because the, your loved one's unbelief is threatening your faith in Jesus and your love for him, then that's what must happen. That's what Jesus means when he talks about taking up the cross and following him. Those who love Jesus and his word must be willing to endure suffering because they believe in him. And that even includes enduring the scorn from those family members who don't believe or have since drifted from the faith. How do Jesus' words affect you? Do they make you Stop and take stock of your life. Maybe you look at your life and you do see some sinful habits cropping up there. These habits have always been calling after you and you just haven't found a way to say no to them. And so maybe you have habits such as gossiping because you get some pleasure out of hearing dirt on people you know. And then you just can't wait to share the juicy details with others. Or maybe you look at your life and you see sinful addictions that cling to you like a tick. And they could be anything. Addiction to shopping. Addiction to binging alcohol. Addiction to viewing pornography. Addiction to taking a hit of that, off that illegal drug. And many other things. You know these addictions are wrong. But you can't quite let them go. Because they do put your mind at ease. And they give you a break from life's daily stresses. You, you, we look at these sinful habits we've developed. We look at those, sin, those pet sins and addictions that we get some perverse pleasure out of. But as we look at that, here comes the devil, and he whispers into our ear, Oh, you know you enjoy these things. You know you want to hold on to them. So go on. 
Keep them around in your life. You know these things bring you peace of mind. Oh, oh wait, you hear Jesus' words say that they're, that they're bad for you? That they don't give you peace of mind? What does he know anyway? He just wants to take, take away your fun. Are you going to let him do that? And here we fall victim to Satan's cruel advice. And no matter what it is, whatever sinful habit or addiction or vice we struggle with, we realize we have valued that more than our relationship with Jesus. We have been putting that above him. Or what about Jesus' words concerning love for others? How do those words affect you? Maybe you can think of some family members or loved ones who at one time were faithful worship, worship attenders, but now they haven't been to worship in ages. Sure, maybe they still maintain membership here at St. John's or at some other church, but they don't seem to make worship and God's word a priority in their life. As you think about Jesus' words there, maybe you're thinking, surely Jesus doesn't want me to stop loving these people, does he? Surely he does want me to continue to love them. And if they're straying from the word, to corral them with the word and warn them, right? Indeed, Jesus isn't saying here that we shouldn't love our family members. But what he is saying is that our love for them should not outweigh our love for him. But once again, here comes the devil, twisting Jesus' word like he enjoys doing. And he once again whispers in our ear, you know, that's exactly what Jesus means. He doesn't want you to love any family members at all. He wants you to love only him. But you care about your family members, right? You want what's best for them, right? So who cares then if they don't attend worship anymore or if they don't believe in God anymore, period? You, you know you don't want to have that falling out with them because they aren't making God's word a priority anymore. So go ahead. When you're around them, stop trying to corral them with God's word and warn them about their eternal fate. Stop trying to, to warn them about their spiritual welfare. In fact, when you're with them, hide your faith from them. Because if you hide your faith from them, well, then their unbelief can't threaten you. And you can still give equal devotion to both Jesus and your family members. And once again, we fall for Satan's cruel advice. We do value our our love for our family members at times more than we do our Lord Jesus. We, we do this because we do indeed hate getting into arguments with them when we try to warn them with God's word that they are in danger of being lost if they don't come back to Jesus. And as far as Jesus saying that we're not worthy of him if we love others more than him, surely he can't be serious about that, can he? How serious is Jesus about loving others more than him? Here's what he says next. Whoever finds his life will lose it. This may seem paradoxical at first. How can someone find his life but then lose it? But this phrase explains Jesus' previous words simply and effectively. With this phrase, Jesus is saying, My child, I've called you to be my own. I've called you to follow me and my word. I've called you to be faithful to me all your life. But all the things of this life, the sinful habits, addictions, vices that Satan tempts you with, love for family, care for possessions, all these things can easily turn you away from me. Plus, being my follower does mean you must endure hardship. And that does include scorn from those family members who don't believe or have fallen from faith. 
That's why I warn you not to love anyone or anything more than me. You might think these things may not har- might not harm you. You might think you, you can give equal attention to both your faith in me and your love for others. You might think that by hiding your faith from, from your loved ones who don't believe, their unbelief can't harm you, and you can still be a faithful, devoted follower to me. But that's putting you on the wrong path. For if you decide it's too much to suffer for my name, if you decide that you can't lose anything in this life over and above losing your faith in me, then it's not going to end well for you. For if you compromise by, by giving up your faith in me simply for peace with this world, your eternal welfare is in jeopardy, and you could be lost. That's how serious Jesus is about loving others, other people, or other things more than him. He sets it up as a matter between eternity in heaven and eternity in hell. And as we examine all these things, we must confess that we've done this. We have indeed loved people more than we have loved Jesus. We have put more value, more pleasure into those sinful habits and addictions and vices that we fall into easily rather than putting a lot of value and joy into our, the gift of faith we have. We have indeed desired peace with the world more than we've desired peace with Jesus. And indeed, all these things prove that we are not worthy of him. But thankfully, Jesus doesn't stop there. In the midst of these deep, soul-searching, heart-cutting words, Jesus offers a glimmer of hope. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Lose life? Lord, you just condemned us for loving people and things more than you. How exactly is this offering some hope for us? Just as concealing or rejecting the faith because you don't want to lose anything in this life, whether it's love for family, care for your possessions, even that perverse pleasure you get from your sinful habits, just as that can jeopardize your salvation, so also enduring all kinds of suffering, including loss of family, for Jesus' sake, will make your salvation worth it all in the end. So once again, in these simple words, Jesus comes to you and says, hold on, my child. I know life is painful. I know it's not easy being my disciple. You've endured a lot of loss. Loss of opportunities at work. Loss of wealth. Loss of prestige. Loss of friends. Even loss of family. I know it can be difficult. But be courageous, for I have overcome the world. I have triumphed over sin and Satan for you. I have taken away all your sins with my death on the cross. That includes all the times you loved family and friends more than you loved me. That includes all the times you found joy in those sinful habits and addictions and vices more than you found joy in my word. That includes all the times you desired peace with this world more than, than peace with me. I've taken away all your sins, my child. And our Father declares you holy in his sight. And so now I give you my peace. Peace that this world cannot understand, nor does it want to understand, or even have in its possession. I give you peace between you and our Heavenly Father. And I also give you my heavenly mansions. Well, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sadness, nothing that can harm you. I know you've experienced hardship and trouble because you believe in me. And I know that includes the various temptations Satan throws your way and even scorn from 
with, even from within your own family, from those who may have drifted from the faith. But hold on to me. Hold on to my word. For my peace and my salvation, gifts I freely give you simply because I love you, will all be worth it in the end. With this comforting promise, we now forge ahead. We continue living our faith each day of grace our Lord Jesus gives us. And that means taking on whatever comes our way, both the good and the bad. Indeed, some days of Christian living are truly a struggle. For perhaps Satan fiercely attacks us again with that sinful habit, addiction, or pet sin that we just can't seem to shake. Or maybe we struggle with confronting a, a, a family member or friend who's drifted from the faith. Perhaps we struggle with confronting them with God's word and warning them that, they, that they're in danger spiritually and eternally if they don't return to Jesus. Indeed, on these days, we are reminded of the cross that each Christian carries. For each Christian does carry a cross simply because they, de they believe in Jesus as their Savior. And there are days that that cross is excruciating to carry. And in those moments, we could be tempted to just give up, to just throw that cross off our backs and give up the faith even just so we could have peace with this world. On those days, indeed, it is a burden that we carry. But at the same time, there are also good days that come from our Heavenly Father. On those days, when you run into a pastor, a teacher, a fellow believer from, from church, and they share with you some comfort from God's Word, those days are blessings for you. For Jesus puts it this way. Whoever receives you, receives me. Whoever receives a prophet or a righteous man, because he is a prophet or righteous man, they will receive a prophet's reward or a righteous man's reward. When you receive a called worker or a fellow believer who brings you God's word, simply because they're bringing you the comfort from God's word, then you're really receiving our Lord Jesus Christ. And those who receive the bringers of God's word receive wonderful blessings. They do receive that peace with God the Father. They receive endurance for hardship. They receive confidence in prayer and numerous other blessings like those. Also, maybe you notice Jesus made a reference to giving a cup of water to a little one. What he's referring to is our daily acts of faith. Those acts which we do daily out of love for Jesus and his word and the peace that word brings, those acts don't go unnoticed. For on those days, as we live our faith, those same blessings that come to us when we, we receive people who bring God's word to us, they also come to us as special gifts of grace from our Lord. Indeed, those days of good in Christian living are truly blessings from the Lord. Not peace, but a sword. Indeed, Jesus' coming does usher in hardship and strife between believers and unbelievers. And maybe that's extended even to our families. Oh yes, there are times that living our faith isn't easy. We might feel pressure to not to give up the faith because we can't withstand the scorn of those loved ones of ours who maybe have drifted from the faith the faith or have not believed at all. We may also feel pressured to give up the faith because we just can't seem to let go of those sinful habits and vices that have been with us all our lives. And on those days, it may seem more easy to just throw in the towel and stop chasing that peace between us and God that Jesus gives us. But in those moments, don't down, my brothers and sisters, but keep pressing forward. Keep living your Christian faith, for your Savior has secured your place in heaven for you. Now, that's a gift that this world can't exceed or even match. So keep focusing on Jesus and his peace. 
keep your hope in that promise of eternal life with him, then when you stand before Jesus in all his glory on judgment day, I pray that you hear him say to you, you loved me in my peace more than anything. You are worthy of me. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We now continue with our confession of faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us sent for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This evening, we will include a special prayer of thanksgiving on behalf of our sister in faith, Mackenzie Peterson, and her husband, Zach. This past Thursday, God blessed Mackenzie and Zach with the gift of a healthy baby girl, Addison Grace. We also remember in our prayers tonight our sister in faith, Doris Waldbauer, who is hospitalized. We bow our hearts in prayer. Holy Spirit, we praise you for pouring out spiritual understanding on Jesus' disciples at Pentecost. You came to them when they were confused and in doubt and taught them what Jesus meant when he told them he would die and rise again. You came to them when they were timid and afraid, and you moved them to speak boldly about the great things God had done to save the world from sin. Dear Holy Spirit, we too have felt uncertain and hesitant. Give us the courageous conviction of faith to speak to others about Jesus as you enabled the disciples to do on Pentecost. Let us experience the joy of leading others to discover the way to heaven through faith in Jesus. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, for the times we have failed to speak of Jesus' love to others because we were afraid. Forgive us for not trusting in your power and for not relying on your word of truth to bring others to faith. Help us remember your promises that when we share the Savior with others, you will be with us and will give us the words to say. Lord of life, we once again marvel at the wonderful way in which you bring children into the world. Accept our thanks for holding a protecting hand over our sister in faith, Mackenzie Peterson, in childbirth, and for bringing joy to her and her husband, Zach, with the guilt, gift of a healthy baby girl. Bless Addison Grace. Receive her into your family through the sacrament of baptism, and protect her from danger of body and soul. Give her parents the love, wisdom, and means to care for her that you have entrusted to them. And, O oh Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servant Doris Waldbauer in her illness. If it is your will, restore her strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with Doris and bless the medical means employed on her behalf with your, your healing power. We commit her to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions.
Empower us to seize every opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus' love and salvation. Open the hearts of people everywhere so that many thousands will enter the kingdom of believers through the gospel, which your church proclaims throughout the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, in whose name we also join together and pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you, and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor, and give you peace. You may be seated. We close with the singing of the hymn, Jesus Lead Us On. Good evening to all of you once again, and to everyone who's watching this online. How you doing? It's great for you to see you here, and it's a joy for me to share with you God's Word. Just a couple of announcements for you tonight. Um, next weekend, we are having our, our annual service for the nation, um, and we are going to have our regular worship schedule, which means next Saturday, the 4th of July, we will have our 7 o'clock worship, as we have been for the last couple of weeks and also be a communion Sunday. So join us next weekend. And thanks to God for the blessings he gives us through our nation. And also, um, the July newsletter was, was just um, sent out yesterday. Um, for those of you who receive it via email, hopefully you received that. 
Um, for those of you who receive it in the mail, that should hopefully be coming to you in the next few days. If you need to get a, access a copy of it, please go to the website, www.stjohnsbc.org, and you'll find it under the, the resources tab on the page. Now, that is all the announcements I had. Um, it's great seeing you again. And in the words of the Beverly Hillbillies, y'all come back now. You hear? Have a blessed week.